morning, so back to English. Um, so after this one week break, uh, let's try to start with a little bit of reminders. So we were in the section, I think it was one four entanglement. what an entangled state is, uh, that is not a mixture of products. And uh, then we looked at general inequalities. And that is sort of where we are. I think that is basic numbering. Yeah, okay. So, so the setting here is uh, correlation inequalities. So we have a source that emits particles to two dis usually distant locations, and uh, then we make some measurements on them. So it's Bob and it's Alice, and they apply their measurements and get some results. And this, this is described by some probability function that says how likely is any combination of results given the devices that I've used. Right? So there would be an FA, which observable was used, and also uh, what source there was. And um, so if this is expressed in a, in a classical probabilistic theory, um, Ah, yeah, okay. Um, yes, so, so there's one quality that we call the Bell correlation that can be done in this, in this situation where A and B are actually plus and minus one and there are I from zero to one labels um, for, these, for these devices. So, um, so we sum over all this stuff Two devices, two outcomes for any any of these devices, and then there is a b times minus one to the i j some signs, and these probabilities. So p a b f a. So the, uh, there are now two different choices of devices. I put zero and one, and same for Bob and the source. Right? And the, the main result here for, for the, is the so-called Bell inequality of Klaus or Horn Shimoni Holt Bell inequality. That is, this is less than two. If P comes from the classical model. I'm not going to redefine all that. Basically, that means that for every device that you use, you need a, a classical description of a device in the context of that theory. And then that these, so that the source sort of distributes some classical information, so-called hidden variable, if you want. And, uh, well, then the device is but given, given this, this uh, classical information, the devices are independent, and then you conclude that you can the other one too. So one of the things that obviously has to be said now is why is that worth even stating? Well, because quantum mechanics violates that. So you know that there is no possible classical model in the quantum case. So how can quantum mechanics be this? So, of course, this, 
this this quantity, this Bell correlation, is computed completely in terms of the observed probabilities. You don't have to know how they are generated, whether there was actually a quantum system traveling around or uh, what the inner workings of all these devices is. You just see the correlation. Right? You can make certain choices and you see the correlation. So, of course, you can simplify the expression in the quantum case a little bit. Of course, beta is then now the sum of a j sum a b a b minus 1 to the i j uh, and now we have to write the quantum expression for this probability so this will be the trace of the density operator like all probabilities and then we have tensor product devices here so when I vary, these are positive operators and uh, they add up to 1 when A runs over all outcomes, right? Uh, and that, of course, happens for each of these choices. And we can simplify that a little bit. So we can do the sum over A of the A's and B's. Right? There are two operators here, right? so A uh, runs over the two possibilities, plus and minus. There are two positive operators, which are less than one, and here we have the difference of the two, essentially. Right? F A plus minus F A minus, that's what is written there. So, uh, so that means that each of these operators is less than one, because, okay, let's, let's write this out. This, if I subtract something from anything, then I get a smaller operator. This is a positive operator. Right? So this is less than F A I plus 1, and this is less than 1. Right? And I can do the estimate in the other direction, it's completely symmetric, so that we know that minus 1. Uh, less than a i. Also the same goes for the b's less than plus. So these are actually the constraint and uh, because these two operators add up to the identity, if I have one of them satisfying this condition, I can construct the other one and get positive probabilities out. Right? So this is exactly, so this, these operators a i contain all the information I need about a dichotomic measurement that has outcomes plus or minus one, right? Um, so these, uh, so these determine the measurements. Well, actually, one. Because this is between 0 and 1, that is going to be a positive operator, and clearly the two add up to 1. Right? So this is another way of see seeing that all the information about the measurements is actually sitting in these operators. Right? So, so the beta now is trace row A1 and so B1 plus B2. Plus 
This is again just this expression, the sum over the i's and j's. Ah, sorry, I should call, call them 0 and 1. <laughs> I, I must have written this ex expression a million times in my life. Uh, so I have to apologize for I have to apologize for having taken over here. Okay? Probably a silly question, but could you write the i's and j's on the diagram at the very top? The i's and j's are just the labels of these things. I have to mm -hmm. make have Alice has two choices of devices. Mm. And each one, of, each one of these choices gives one such operator. Mm. Right? But this, this, this operator then determines all the probabilities for this choice. Otherwise, the two choices, the different i's, have nothing to do with each other. So I should draw something like two diagrams? Four. Yeah, four. Four. Okay. But there are four experiments that we have to make. Okay, so you, so you add up all the correlations with one funny sign. Right? Actually, if you redefine what is plus and minus for any one of these operators, you get a sign for that. Right? So if you just swap it to uh, the two outcomes, now it's correct. Right? If you just swap the two outcomes for A1, this would uh, get a sign there. Okay, no big deal. Okay, so but how, how do we... How do we get a larger expression? Now there are three proofs that I know for the basic inequality of what you can achieve. Right? The simplest thing to do um, uh, is to just give you an example. I think this is what I will do. And then uh, um, comment a little bit on the other possibilities. So let's just do the example. And I emphasize the example because one of these methods would show that actually it's in some sense the only example that reaches this maximal value. Um, so Alice and Bob each have a two-dimensional Hilbert space. So you, you couldn't possibly do something smaller, right? Um, and uh, rho is uh, Psi, psi, psi is the singlet state. Now, think of these as two spin one, spin one half particles, and um, then you you have this in one one st one state that is invariant in the rotations. And then one that behaved that three others together make a spin one representation. So, but this one is is um, so these are the generators of the rotations up to a factor one half. Right? The joint rotations of both qubits right? and. The singlet state is defined by this joint eigenvalue equation. Okay, this is one thing, one of those facts I will use. And now also, if you trace out, so I take the the pure, this this state rho, and I take the partial trace over the second factor. Right? So this is this will be a state which is rotation invariant because. Uh, the whole state is rotation invariant, and therefore it will be invariant uh, under rotation. Uh, so, so this is an under rotation. So, so, uh, so the trace of sigma k. Well, let's just write it like this. Right? Well, I guess the normal way to write this would be sigma k and so one. This is zero. Right? So the expectation of these Pauli operators are zero. 
That just means that this is the unpolarized state of the Poincaré sphere. It's the center of the Poincaré sphere. Right? So here we have a qubit state, this partial trace. And the only one that is invariant under rotations is the center. Right? Because these rotations act like three-dimensional rotations. So um, what else do we need? Now what we do want to compute now is, um, so we know that if we have a sigma k sticking on one side and the identity on the other, we get zero. So the question is, what do we get when we compute something like this? I take two numbers from 1 to 3, k and l, and I look at all these correlations. Now, if I have all these numbers, I know the state completely because every operator can be expanded in terms of these guys, so then I have a complete description of the state. Right? So, so let's compute these things. Now this is psi, sigma k tends to sigma l, uh, so think times 1, times 1 tends to sigma l. Now, I use this equation. So if I act, if I act on psi with one, one, one such operator, 1 tends to a sigma, I can just shift the sigma to the other side. So, so this is psi sigma k tensor 1 minus, sorry, the sum of these two guys is 0, minus sigma l tensor 1. Okay, so what do we get? Uh, well, we, of course we can put these together, right? So this is minus psi sigma k times sigma l. So this is a product of two power matrix and tends to the identity. Now there are two possibilities. One is that these two are the same. k and l are the same index from 1 to 3. In that case, I just get the square of a Pauli matrix. Well, the way they are, they are defined, the, these squares are just 1. So I get the expectation of 1, and since psi is a normalized state, I just get 1. Now, if they are different, for example, k and l are 1 and 2, I get i sigma 3. These are the multiplication rules for the Pauli matrices. So this is another Pauli matrix, but then I can use this property to conclude that that, that will be 0. So when k is different from l, this product is going to be a factor i times a Pauli matrix, or plus minus i times a Pauli matrix, and therefore this expectation is zero. So we've done the complete computation now, this is minus delta kl. Okay? Now, so this is, this is just a description of the state, basically, that we've given now. So there's the singlet state, has this sort of probabilities. Now, how can we make a violation of Bell inequalities out of that? So, now choose vectors. Uh, let's say, more precise, unit vectors. Call them A, I, B, J. Then we put a vector arrow on top. So these are unit vectors in R3, so they are on the surface of the block wall, if you like. And I use them to define these operators that we need, namely AI is going to be AI vector, and so the vector of Pauli matrices. So what I mean by this is the sum with these coefficients, AI, let's say alpha, sigma, or let's say K, Okay. Right. So actually this is basically a Pauli matrix rotated in another direction and this direction is indicated by the vector. Right. If A is the vector in the Z direction, I get Pauli Z. And otherwise I just get a Pauli matrix in some other direction. These things, as written there, because I've taken unit vectors, uh, have square 1 and trace 0. That's 
basically the, that's the defining property. And, uh, and similarly, I take these operators bj to be this vector bj uh, in power. Okay. So let's look at the probabilities that we need. So we need these. Um, what we have to compute is psi ai tends to bj. Well, I just put in these expansions, and I have this delta function. So this is uh, sum a i k uh, b j l times another minus k l is the expectation of tensor product of parties, right? So this is just uh, minus vector a i scalar product of vector b j. So. We can directly write down the Bell correlation. So Bell correlation is equal to minus, there's an overall minus sign. And then I have A, now I have to do the indices right. So this was A naught scalar product with B naught plus B1. And the second term is A1 scalar product with B naught minus B1. Remember that we want to make this as large as possible. Right? We want to beat this classical limit too. And uh, now, suppose Bob has already fixed his vectors in some way. Then what do we get? Uh, Alice should choose these guys, these vectors, these unit vectors, A0 and A1, the brackets, yeah? in such a way that this expression becomes as large as possible. And she can do the same for the second term. These two variational problems are completely independent. Right? So, uh, so if we maximize this with respect to A's, to the two A's, what we get, well, what is the maximum actually? <laughs> we have a scalar product. So here's some vector that's fixed. Right? Some, some funny vector. Now we are allowed to choose a unit vector and try to make the scalar product as large as possible. Think of this geometrically. Right? Uh, if Without the minus sign, of course, you would just get, take the vector in the direction of this, um, of the vector that is written there. Right? The unit vector in the direction that is written there. Uh, because the scalar product is the product of the two absolute values times the cosine of the angle. So the cosine you can make one, that's the best you can do. Right? Now, you have the minus sign, so you actually take the vector in the opposite direction. But in either case, what you get is the, this, right? the absolute value, the length of this vector, b0 plus b1. And of course, the same, these are, as I said, these are independent, so you get So after maximization over A, from a three-dimensional geometrical problem to a two-dimensional problem because there are only two unit vectors involved and they span a plane, right? So we draw our pictures in the plane where they are. Also, if we rotate the two vectors by the same amount, nothing changes with these absolute values. We just get a rotation matrix in there and that, that will not change the absolute values. So, without loss of generality, we can say that this is B1 and this is B0. And I've written this 
somewhat symmetrically, and there is an angle called it, well, beta is already used, so let's call it alpha. Right? So we have two unit vectors, and then we have to look at the sum and the difference of these two guys. Now the sum we know how to do, this is the parallel, parallelogram construction. So here is B0 plus B1. Let's put vector errors everywhere. And B0 minus B1 is this guy. Right? So we have to compute these lengths. And I propose to do that in terms of the angle alpha. Now, if you look at this triangle here, somebody was using colored chalk here. Okay, I, I won't do this mess, but, uh, but anyway, I'm looking at this triangle here. Right? This should look familiar from the definition of, of uh, sine and cosine functions. So actually, the half the distance to B0 plus B1 is just the cosine. And half this thing is just the, the sign, right? So actually, we get uh, twice, because this is only half the distance, um, sine alpha, absolute value, plus cosine alpha. Well, if we take alpha between 0 and pi over 2, as indicated there, which we may, right? Because make it larger, we just get the same thing on the other side, and nothing really changes. So, uh, so let's write this as 2 sine alpha plus cosine alpha, uh, where we just use that. Alpha is in the first quadrant, as strong there, which we may use. So, now, the, the sum of a sine and a cosine pretty much, much looks like another cosine with a, with a phase shift, right? So it's clear that this takes its absolute value somewhere. Do you happen to know or do you have an expectation where this would be the case? Well, let's compute it, okay. Uh, but we really want to do the, we really want to get the maximum here, right? So we are a bit more. I could just give you the value and say, ah, oh, here we get twice the square root of two. But um, let's just do that. So how do you compute the maximum of this function if you don't have your table, Gradstein, Rischig, and stuff at hand, or maybe make a Mathematica plot and a guess? Or so. <laughs> well, whatever. Okay, let's let's do that. Um, so this is still the factor 2. Then there's a real part of e to the i alpha that gives you the cosine. To get the sine, you want the imaginary part, which is minus i times the real part of the same thing. Right? So um, tell me if you find this all too, too, too detailed and therefore boring. But, um, Clearly, I can write this as, well, twice the square root of 2, and then another phase written like that. So this is a, this is a complex number of modulus 1. It has real part 1 and imaginary part minus 1, uh, well, apart from the fact of 1 over square root of 2, because I normalized it. So this is 45 degrees in the southeast direction, right? So, which is just twice the square root of 2, real part of e to the i alpha minus pi over 4, right? Those are the 40, 45 degrees in the southeast direction. So, where do I get the maximum? Well, where well, alpha is equal to this guy, so we get the real part we, we're taking the real part, right? so we have to make this angle zero, if we can. So this is equal to twice the square root of 2 if alpha is pi over 4. Now, but for pi over 4, we can just compute these guys, right? They're just, well, then this is 1, so we get, get twice the square root of 2. So you take the 45 degree angle. 
So actually, one way to understand this is uh, ah yes, and also automatically the 2a direction would be in the direction of these vectors. So they will be orthogonal, right? And the b directions would also be orthogonal, right? So we could have maybe argued like that even. So if I look at the vectors, um, then I get a0, a1. These are all unit vectors, right? Now the, the, um, this direction to b1, it's 45 degrees. Ah, wrong this is the B1. And this is the. No, this should be the B0. And this is the B1. Doesn't really matter about the signs. But what do we get here? So we have the scalar products that we have in our expression. Look at this thing. Right? have positive signs for 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and only for the 1, 1 combination, we get a minus sign. So you try to make, to choose your B so that it is as similar as possible to the A's, the B's, so the B0, and the B1 should be very similar to the A0, but very dissimilar to the uh, A1. And that's, that's this, what this configuration does for you. Okay, so, so quantum hits this number. Now, this, you can make the direct proof of that directly in terms of arbitrary operators. That would be the next level. Right? So this is an example. And in the example of 2 by 2 matrices, basically that's our only assumption. That everything here is in terms of 2 by 2 matrices and Pauli matrices and uh, so this is pretty much a complete maximization over examples with two two-dimensional Hilbert spaces. Now what if the Hilbert space is larger dimensional? Well then there's a little computation telling you that you cannot do better actually. Um, there's a curious thing here that in dimension 3 you can't even hit the twice square root of 2. Um, but in all even dimensions you can. And uh, so, but this, this, this bound here, this maximization, turns out to be the maximum also if the dimension of the Hilbert space is arbitrary. And uh, so th this, is, this is the second derivation for this inequality here, or for this, for this value. And the third derivation tells you even more. It tells you, suppose that, that I get a violation of 2 square root of 2, so the maximum quantum value then actually the only way you can do that is by this example. So this is, this, these days this goes under the, the keyword of self-testing. That is, by just looking at an overall correlation, like this Bell correlation, you can say what the state was and what the observables basically were. Of course, up to tensor and large systems that have nothing to do with these me measurements to the whole thing, right? So, so you have this, this, this two-qubit example sitting inside whatever Alice and Bob have for systems. Now, so, we, so you have to be a bit better than that even. Maybe you have to show if you have almost twice the square root of two, then this is actually almost true. Right? This is always the... Uh, the stability that makes all these things, I mean, without that, all these things would be uninteresting. Or practically uninteresting. So, this is actually a cryptographic statement. And when we proved that in the 80s, Stephen Summers and myself, we had no idea that this was related to quantum cryptography. Right? But it actually is. Because what does it say? It says, suppose we, we just take this maximal violation. So we have this maximal violation, then we know that the state restricted to these two must basically be a singlet. So it has to be a pure state. So we have a pure state for this pair of qubits. And then, well, we just know that the restricted state of the overall state 
to, uh, the, the state restricted to these two qubits has to be pure. But that means it's actually a tensor product. Right? So the only way, so this is a tensor product between these two qubits and the rest of the world. But it's a pure state on, the, on one of the factors, which immediately implies that it is this pure state, tensor whatever the, the, for, the, for the rest. Right? Um, so actually, it shows that the correlations that come out of this measurement are statistically independent of the whole rest of the world. And therefore they're secret. Right? So, so nobody else could know about these correlations or could, could find a variable in the rest of the world that would still be correlated with what they'd see. Right? So it's always just a problem. Okay, so, so those are the further levels of uh, Looking at the Bell inequality, I should say that so, so this the statement that this is actually the best quantum value is called Cirrhizon's uh, inequality. And of course, this two by two example has is pretty much what has been approximately realized by two photon measurements. Right? So this, of course, comes out. And quantum mechanics is right about this prediction. So if you set your polarizers uh, correctly to realize this example with photons and polarization, then you do get twice the square root of two. And this is interesting because if you could say that by this experiment, classical models have been falsified. They cannot possibly be right. So, but had the experiments, experiments, so the first really efficient experiment for this was uh, by Alain Aspect and there were earlier ones by Clauser, but nowadays this is kind of a lab routine, right? So everybody could just to warm up and check whether devices are working as designed, you measure a bell inequality or something. Right? So, so this, is, this is now pretty much routine. Um, so had they found a little bit more, they would have falsified quantum mechanics in the same sense as uh, classical models were falsified by beating the bell in right? Okay, um, I said it's lab routine, well not quite. Um, and this, 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 this goes by the, by the catchphrase of loopholes in the, in the bell inequalities. So, the situation that is described here is very straightforward, but actually the experiments are not exactly like that. They usually don't realize this exactly. And uh, one of the deviations here is that, that uh, one, one important loophole here is that this assumes that the total probability is one. That is, either one, I either get a plus one or a minus one. But in reality, actually, if you use photon detectors, what you would, you, you would realize that by a polarizer and a subsequent um, photo detector. Now, these photo detectors have very low efficiencies, usually. Well, at least when these experiments started, uh, they, they had fairly low efficiencies. So actually, the, what, what they have in the experiment is not plus one, minus one, but plus one, minus one, and no detection with a majority on no detection. So this was the so-called detection loophole. Because you see, if the no detection becomes likely enough, that is, the efficient detector efficiencies are bad enough, then you can just make a classical model for this new situation. Um, the, in the early days, you would discuss that away by saying, well, but this would be kind of a conspiracy, right? Namely, it would be a conspiracy of the sort that the probability for detection actually depends on the setting on the other side. Right? So, uh, no, no, it doesn't, no, no, not even that. But it would depend on which, which of the two you, you, you're looking at, what the whole configuration is. So you would, you would argue that this, well, this would be strange. Well, yes, it would be strange, but still, you would like to have a clean realization where you don't have to make such funny arguments. And so, the, um, so actually building a Bell sort of experiment with high detection efficiencies 
And also, in such a way that the two detections were space-like separated, right? so you should be no light, side, light signal being able to inform one side what the other had just said. Um, so, so this is the so-called locality loophole, um, that you can still think of communication, subluminal communication. Um, so closing both at the same time was only done last year, so it's, it's relatively recent. Of course, you can think of even more loopholes. Right? So there is the free will loophole that tells you that Alice and Bob, in this idealized scenario, they choose these devices. Well, what if they cannot choose and God has chosen making these choices eons ago? Right? So there is no free will that allows them to choose, and there is a conspiracy between this, these, the, this device and God. And well, if you, if you make that sort of assumption, of course, nothing is possible anymore because you cannot safeguard against that. Right? But um, anyway, very good experiments now are available. Uh, they had no element whatsoever of surprise. Right? So it was difficult to do, but nobody in his right mind would have thought that maybe if you close all the loopholes, then suddenly you maybe don't get a violation of Bell inequalities anymore. And, uh, well, there were some crazy people who would have expected that maybe, but really very few and fairly crazy. So, certainly the majority of the physicists didn't expect anything like that. And the reason for that is that this is a very simple quantum mechanical prediction. And thinking that quantum mechanics would go wrong on something as simple as this, would really be a major, I mean, require a major overhaul of the whole theory, and nobody was expecting this, right? So quantum mechanics is so well confirmed on so many issues that being wrong on a two-by-two two example like this, uh, just because you close these loopholes, would seem crazy. Right? And so nobody, nobody was really surprised, but still I think it's an important experiment to do. Okay, yeah. I was, I was talking too much, huh? Yeah, but having plus one, minus one, and no detection, it's like, it's not equivalent to having three-dimensional space. And you meant three outcomes? Yeah, you could think, you could analyze this as a three-outcome experiment. But wasn't the claim that in three outcomes I cannot get two square root of... Oh, with, yeah, well, there are difficult, different inequalities for three outcomes. Mm -hmm. But certainly, if, the, if you see only part of these outcomes, um, and then they, they may be just as difficult to beat. I mean, to, to, to beat the quantum limits, right? So there are more inequalities. So this, this, this particular inequality, the CHSH inequality, um, is just the lowest level of a whole hierarchy of Bell inequalities that could together exactly describe when you have a classical model and when you don't. This is, a, this is an infinite hierarchy and actually making progress in this hierarchy as you turn up the parameters, like more measurements, more outcomes, maybe even more parties, um, doing that is known to be a badly growing problem. Is it countable set? It's a countable set, yeah. Uh, but that is not saying much, right? It's, it's, a hard, it's difficult to compute. So yeah, but, I mean, is there an algorithm to derive ants? Uh, <laughs> Ask this man. <laughs> How difficult is it to make new in the new Bell inequalities? It's getting pretty difficult. X. Um, I only try to um, choose more numbers of different me uh, measurement devices, and it's getting more difficult if you choose more uh, measurement devices. For example, um, I made a run uh, assumption for the runtime, and I was able to compute or found the results for 5 by 5 matrices, uh, so uh, 5 measurement devices for Alice and 5 measurement devices for Bob. And my runtime for this problem would be a year. And as a person wrote a more efficient way to compute this, and he made this computation, and I used his results on this point. And if you choose even higher dimensions, with my methods, I would um, the runtime for the problem with six measurement devices on Alice side and seven on Bob's side would be already twice as high as the age of the universe. So it's it, it grows pretty damn bad. 
Yeah. But Blizzard is an algorithm to drive all of them. Yes. There are yes. Because because this classical the, the set of classical correlations is a polytope, is a convex set, fairly high dimensional. Of course, the dimension goes up as these parameters go up. So, um, and you explicitly know the extreme points. The extreme points are, 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 are related to just choosing outcomes for every device. Right? And one definite choice makes one of these extreme points, a finite set of extreme points. So, the, the finding the Bell inequalities would be a description of this body in terms of supporting hyperplanes. Right? So you have to find the faces of this polytope, the maximal faces mm -hmm. of this polytope. This is known as the Hull problem. Right? This is just a name, but, just, but there are bounds on how fast this is going to grow in, in generic cases. And of course there might be something simplifying here, but it's still known to, to grow very, very bad. And so, But yeah, but I mean, if I know all the faces, then I will know all the... Yeah, then you have all the inequalities, right? That's it. It's exactly the description of the faces, if you want. Right? So it's, it's a finite problem, all right. It's a well-known finite problem, <laughs> which doesn't make it easier. Okay, um, so what else should I tell you? Um, Yes, some, so something that you're definitely going to need in the, in the, as we go further, uh, we have half an hour, right? Um, would be a pure state attack. And let me just begin talking about that. So this is one, four, two, one, four, three. So Alice and Bob are still around, and uh, our density operator is psi psi. Okay. Now we would say now we know we have a definition of what entanglement means for a density operator, and we are we said already that well it says entanglement or unentangled separable means that this is a mixture of products. Now, pure state isn't a mixture of anything, so it has to be itself a product. Right? So, um, is uh, unentangled if and only if psi is a form of phi 1 and phi 2. Right? So, but if you want to classify the sort of entanglement that you might get, in pure states, then, uh, well, there are many more possibilities than that, right? So everything else is entangled, but how entangled, for example, right? can, can you compare? And I'll uh, answer a very simple question of this sort. Then we say that psi and psi prime are equally entangled. So if basically they are the same state up to a choice of basis, maybe based separately basis for Alice and Bob. Well, I, I, think, I guess I can write this as UA and UB, right? For UA, UB unitary. So I'm basically saying that these are equivalent with respect to local Unitaries. Local meaning that the unitary factorizes. Alice chooses her basis differently, Bob chose his basis differently, and then they can make the state look different right, by just choosing the basis or maybe doing this rotation actively, whatever. But nothing changes in the way of entanglement here. Right? It's, it's just a way of, the, the way of description changes, but not the state in some sense. So, so now with such an equivalence relation, clearly this is an equivalence relation, um, it, it is interesting to look at the classes. Right? So 
what, what are the equivalence classes of entanglement in that sense? Right? If, if, I, if I take this as my definition of equally entangled. And there is a little lemma, a little, I don't know what to call it, a theorem of that. And this is one of the really useful pieces of information about many of such problems, and that's, so that's our thing. Information, this is the typical time for it, is the Schmidt decomposition. Okay. set because the, these bases are finite sets when we are in finite dimension, but the whole thing is also in different dimension, such that so if I hadn't said orthonormal bases, I could have absorbed this factor into one of the two. Right? So this is these factors actually have something to do with saying orthonormal basis, um, uh, okay, I, see, I saw a critic, I picked up a critical look from David, and of course he's right, uh, this is related to the question, that's what you meant, right? <laughs> Okay, um, so this is related to the question, what happens when the dimensions of HA and HB are very different? They couldn't have this, the same sort of correlated synchronized bases because they have different lengths. Right? The theorem is still true because then uh, when, when, let's say, HA runs out of basis tables because it has a smaller dimension, then the rest will just be zero terms. But then the fi would not be a basis, but would be, would be an ortho orthonormal family which is a bit too short. But written as like this, actually we could say this. <laughs> um, written like this, the theorem is true. Um, there's another statement I would like to make. Um, the uh, EI, fi. Bases up to kind of up to null vectors of the partial traces. Okay. 
So if I take the trace on the second Hilbert space of this pure state, right? so this is the reduced density operator that tells us about the probability of the first, then I just get the sum ci squared ei ei and the trace over the first factor looks very similar. Does the same with the f. You see here that so the c, you see the number c can directly be interpreted, and I mean apart from taking the square root, these are just the probabilities or the eigenvalues of the reduced density operators. And if these are off a normal basis, an expression like that will give you exactly the spectral decomposition. Okay, so this is actually already part of the proof, if you wish. Um, Let's just check. This would be the EI, this would be the eigenbasis here, um, for all the non-zero eigenvalues at least. Right? And then there could be zero eigenvalues that we don't care about at all in this whole, in this whole business. Right? Um, so, but for every, every value where uh, there is an, a, a non-zero eigenvector, um, this will be, uh, so, so I, I only take the sum of those where this is non-zero. And then there's a, there may be further, this is not the basis now, there may be further terms with zero ci, but of course they don't appear in the sum. Right, so there's a, there's a way to represent that. This is not entirely unique. Uh, there could be different values of ci or ci squared that are equal to each other. Right? So there could be degeneracy in this, in this eigenvalue problem for the reduced density operator. And uh, that would be reflected in some sort of ambiguity here, but we can certainly pick one. Right? And that's what we're going to do. We're not going to do the same thing independently for the f's, because then we would directly get into problems with this non-uniqueness on the other side. So we, we make this choice only on one side, but we are free to make it up to this. So then, uh, we can expand. In terms of the first of the basis for this for this first vector, right? uh, so um, call this. Well, I pull out this this factor C i the square root there. This is non-zero, and I can write down this. Well, to whatever it is, right? I just write sum over i. It's going to be some sum. It could be an infinite sum. Um, so we can we can make this expansion that almost looks like this, but we don't. What we don't see immediately here in this expansion is that the fi's are orthonormal. Right? Any vector can be uh, written like that, because any vector in the tensor product can be expanded in products, and I co collect everything on the first factor that belongs to ei to one of the basis vectors. Right? And then I get a rewritten fi. So I can. Um, so this 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 doesn't say anything about the vector actually. So for any basis, this is fine. Maybe this pulling out the ci is a bit unusual. Um, so fi mhb um, for the 
moment we don't know more. So then, but with this expansion, I can compute the partial trace. So that's the tra partial trace on two is the partial trace um, of the following double sum. Sum over i and j, c i, c j, e i tensor f i, e j tensor f j. Now this can be, these cat bras can, pull, can be pulled apart. Right? So we actually, this is a cat bra e i e j, tensored as an operator with a corresponding thing f i f j. I think we, we went through this at some earlier stage. So we're just using that here. And this is the trace over the second factor, so the f part is going to be traced. So this sum c i c j, um, e i e j times the trace of f i f j. Now we can rotate operators under the trace, so we can pull this over here. So this is just a scale product. So um, this whole thing is just f j f i. But on the other hand, we know what, what this psi is. Right? So this is equal to the sum over just a single index, the i squared e i e i. Now, these matrix units are a basis for the, for the vectors. They are linearly independent. So from this inequality, I can conclude that the coefficients must be the same. Now the coefficients of the general matrix unit here is fj fi, right? So fj fi. So here we use the that, um, our linearly independent. Fj, Fi is exactly what I have to put here in order to get um, to get that right. So this is uh, delta j c i squared delta yeah delta that's it. So the CIs are non-zero, so we can cancel that out. So we get uh, FJ. So these Fs are also an orthonormal system. More we cannot conclude. Right? So we, we could have done variations on this proof, for example, by extending this, this sum over EI also over zero terms. Then we actually have a basis for the EI. Uh, but then at this point, we would have been told that we can say nothing about the other coefficients. Well, actually, they have to be zero. <laughs> um, well, I think it's correct. OK. So that is the Schmidt decomposition. And there are, two, there are some extreme cases. <laughs>
maybe just uh, just some very brief remarks. If I fix any arbitrary basis E and F, I would typically get a matrix of coefficients, right? Because we have a product basis and there can be coefficients for every basis vector. Right? So if I fix the basis in general, I get a matrix of coefficients. Here I get a diagonal matrix of coefficients where the diagonal might hit the edge of a rectangle. <laughs> um, that's this, this business about different dimensions. And so this is very, uh, and the, the so, so this is very much related to what is called the singular value decomposition. You could argue this is exactly the singular value decomposition, which is a normal form for a matrix. So you have given, are given an arbitrary matrix, complex numbers, let's say. And you're allowed to make a unitary, you pre and post multiply with unitaries. A unitary like UA tends to be there for equally entangled. Right? So, so you could change the basis on each side, and then you can make the di matrix diagonal. So this is called the singular value decomposition. And actually the way you prove it is pretty much this. Right? So you look at, uh, if x is your matrix, you look, you diagonalize x star x, and then this is what you get. Right? So this is basically the same thing. This is also called the bi orthogonal decomposition, because on both sides you have orthogonals. Okay, so, um, yes, uh, one more piece of terminology. There is an inverse to this. What we see here is how, to, if we have a pure state on, the, on a composite system, um, we, we have basically computed what the reduced density matrix looks like. Right? We do this Schmidt decomposition. The complete invariant for local unitaries is just this family of CIs. Right, these, these you cannot change. Under a local unitary, the reduced density matrix will change by unitary, the one that you've chosen for that factor. And, and density operators up to unitary invariants are exactly given by their eigenvalues. So the classes of equally entangled vectors are given by these decreasing families of Schmidt numbers, right, of these Cs. And so this, this exactly characterizes the state up to local unity, unitary equivalence. Um, okay, so we know how to get to the density operator, and we see that basically any density operator can appear here. So we've also proven the converse, because the CIs are just arbitrary. The only thing that we say here is that we arrange them in decreasing order so to, uh, to reduce the ambiguity a little bit. Right, the numbering ambiguity for the eigenvectors can be reduced a little bit by that. But otherwise, it's uh, basically just the eigen. So, um, so and, and there's no constraint in that. Um, so, so we learn that whatever your density operator is, you can think of it as the restriction of a pure state on a larger space. This is actually a dilation. Uh, so we, I, th I think I mentioned the GNS representation at some point, which is the Steinspring dilation of a state. And this is exactly what you see here once again. Right? So, um, so purification is this process by going to a larger Hilbert space and getting your given mixed state as a restriction of a, of a pure state. Right? Okay, um, now I would like to make a few comments on So in this whole construction we get some ambiguity in the choice of the first basis more than just a phase factor uh, for each each basis vector that's an ambiguity you always have but you get more when there's a degeneracy of the eigenvalue. Now this could be very degenerate, right? So let's think of the case of total degeneracy. So um, a vector psi is called maximum entanglement. Trace 
is, uh, well, let's say, one of the types of an entity. Right? Uh, so, so all the, uh, so th th this is equivalent to saying that all C are equal, uh, equal actually to all C are equal to one over the square root of the dimension. And maximally entangled states, I think, sensibly, should only be discussed when the two dimensions are the same. Right? So you have the, uh, then we really have a dynamic matrix. So up to local unitaries, uh, there is only one maximally entangled state, because I fixed this invariant. I fixed these, uh, fixed the Schmidt numbers. So, Let's, let's look at the prototype, and this would have 1 over the square root of d, sum i, i, right? So this is, of course, shorthand for i, and so i. Um, and I would, so, so one of the examples of this is the singlet state. So there is a minus here, but I can, of course I could just swap one of the signs here. Now this is this is clearly a Schmidt decomposition. Um, only that zero is correlated not with something that was already called zero, but uh, so the f zero would be cat one. that in, you have the form that I've written before. Right? And the, the, the Schmidt coefficients are one of the square of two. Right? So this is a typical thing. And one of the computation things that we use in the computation is interesting to do generally. Right? So, so for every maximally entangled vector, we can do the Schmidt decomposition, which means it's a choice of a basis. All other maximally entangled vectors differ from this by local unitaries. Um, Actually, it's enough to do a unitary on one side, right? and this is this is um, a simple fact. Uh, all this omega. I can move an operator to the other side by transposition. Which, which base C's, I could actually say, right? There are two bases in the Schmidt decomposition. And those are used for the transposition. So let us compute this thing. Right? So A tensor 1. Some vector, right? A acting on the basis vector gives you some other vector, and so I can expand that in the same basis, and then it reads like this: so sum of i and j, j a i, j. So, or if you if you like 
more compact notation, we would write this as the square root, some ij. So this is just the ji matrix element of j, of a, and this is j. So basically, this is just you, you act on the matrix, of, or you multiply the matrix of, uh, of, of your basis vectors with a matrix of coefficients. And this is this, pretty much the same that you would get by letting A act on the other side. So let's do that. So this is. Um, I just have to do the same thing backwards. Uh, but with the transpose here, the transpose makes this uh, ij. So this is uh, i a transpose j times j cancel i. And I would, would like to read this as um, A transpose, uh, so, so I, I move this factor back in. Let's, let's just do it on the wall, it's very difficult to see. Some J is outside, J tensor, and then I have a sum of the I. Uh, But this is the identity. So I have the sum square root D, sum J, J tensor A transpose acting on J. But this is what I claim. Right? So this is the same as identity tensor A transpose. And the rest is just our good old state omega just written in terms of sum with a different dummy index, j instead of i. So this is back to omega. So that is this formula. And that has some consequences. For example, there was a local unitary equivalence. That means I can get from any maximally entangled state to every other maximally entangled state by writing a tensor product of unitaries in front. Well, but here I see that one of these unitaries, just as in our computation for the Bell inequalities a little earlier, right? um, one of the actual one of the unitaries can be pulled to the other side. So there's an overall unitary on one side only. So actually, turning turning around the the, uh, the maximally entangled state can be done by rotating only one side with the unitary. This is. Of course, due to the high degeneracy in the in the Schmidt spectrum, but it's a useful fact and has something has consequences for the possibility of running information protocols with one directional information. Certain certain operations can be done by Alice, which normally would require actions on both sides. Okay, I think time's up. So I thank you for your attention. This would be. By what we talked about earlier, this will be the end of section one. Tomorrow I'll begin talking about tasks and resources. Okay.